up a mighty praise to the Lord right now, would you? In the name of Jesus, this is a house of miracles. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Lord, stretch forth your hand to heal. We make room for healing. We make room for miracles. We make room for your spirit to breathe on us, to give dreams and visions and callings. We ask it all in the name of Jesus. Now give the Lord a mighty praise, everybody. Lord, you deserve the glory. You deserve the praise. You deserve the shout. You deserve the hand claps, God. You're good. You're good. Thank you, Lord. You know, no matter what you face, there are some sure things that never change that you have to remind yourself of, especially when you hit challenging times. You have to believe this to your core. I was thinking about this early this morning. Here's what I know about God. There are a lot of things I don't understand and I don't know and I don't know why. But this is what I know about God and this is what I remind myself always about God. Number one, He is good. He's not mean. He's not angry. He's good. Number two, He really does love me and you. He knows everything about you. He's good and he loves you. Number three, I reminded myself this morning, he is faithful. <laughs> oh yes, he is. He's good. He loves me. Say it. He's good. Somebody ought to write a song about this right here. He's good. He loves me, he's faithful, and here's the last thing the Lord said to me early this morning. He said, and don't you ever forget, I don't care what it looks like, I'm working all things together for the good. I'm working all things together for the good. Now raise your hands and shout with triumph unto the good, the faithful, the loving God who is working all things together. The tragedies, the suffering, the questions, the not knowings. He's still good. He's still faithful. He still loves me. And he's still working it for our good. I believe it. To my core, I believe it. And that's how you overcome. You believe that? Smile at three people around you. Welcome to all of you online. Welcome to all of you at all of our campuses. Want to give a special greeting this morning to Orange County. I know that you're joining us there also. What a joy to preach there last Sunday and to be with you again. We're coming to you live out of Gainesville right now. God bless you. Jesus is in the house. And we're excited about what God is doing. Well, tonight at 6 o'clock, as you pulled up, if you're at our Gainesville campus and all of you at our other campuses, this is, a, this is kind of like a, I don't, know, I don't know what you could call I guess you could call it camp meeting Sunday or something. But we're going to have a praise party tonight outside in the amphitheater at 6 o'clock. I want every teenager, every college student, every young person, I want every mom, every dad, every grandparent, I want us, if ever America needed a praying, praising, crawling out, crying out to God, church, it's in the hour that we're in. And I don't think it's by chance that this just so happened to fall that we have Sean Foyt and his band and movement, really, called Let Us Worship. They, he's going to tell you about them. I'll let him do that. But I want, him to, I want him to come. We're delighted that he came to be with us this morning. But at 6 o'clock, his whole band will be out in the amphitheater. They're doing these concerts, and really it's not a concert. It is a worship miracle 
time of praise and rejoicing where thousands upon thousands of people are getting born again and healed and delivered. It's revival. It sounds like revival. It feels like revival. And it is revival. And it's come to our city today. And it's worth driving from Atlanta, from coming, from Spartanburg. Uh, I would say Orange County, but I'm scared too because some of you are that hungry for God out there that you'd get in your car and try to make it and be over by the time you got here. But would you give a warm welcome to Sean Foyt? He is an amazing evangelist, pastor. Uh, uh, I guess he would be, uh, I don't know, worship leader, servant of the Most High God. We love you, Sean. I believe in you. So honored to have you and your team, the whole team is going to be with us tonight. Kind of tell the people, just keep playing a moment, just kind of tell the people what you, uh, how this thing got started because it was, it was not a bunch of hype and marketing that made this movement. It's a movement. What happened? Well, uh, for the last 20 years, I've, I've spent a lot of my time in the persecuted church across the world. So in, in North Korea and Iraq, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, underground church in China, and I really didn't give a rip about America, to be honest, <laughs> until things started to get crazy. And I have four little kids, and you know, when the pandemic happened and everything shut down, I saw some of the same kind of uh, uh, persecution, oppression, and really uh, the, the kind of the Goliath taunting spirit against the church that I witnessed in the persecuted nations in the world. Wow. And it kind of came to a head when our governor, interesting guy in California, told us we could no longer sing in church. And that's what I was like, okay, it's on. It's on. If there ever was a time we need to worship, while suicide rates are soaring, while fear is going out across America, while cities are burning and violence and unrest, this is the hour we need to worship. And so we took a stand, we gathered on the Golden Gate Bridge. We didn't know if anyone would show up. I felt like it was symbolic and prophetic of the Western Gate of America, an iconic symbol. 400 people gathered with me on the bridge. We were in the wind, I had my guitar, it was out of tune and crazy. And we just began to prophesy over America. We said a new Jesus people movement is coming to this nation. There is a revival. The enemy overplayed his hand in 2020 and God's turning it around. So here we are, 132 cities since. And isn't that amazing? 132 cities? Jeez. And they've been in cities like Seattle, Portland, South Chicago, where nobody will go. Everybody's scared to go. But they go in, they throw up a stage, they put up a sound system, and they begin to sing about a man named Jesus in a place called Calvary and the blood that he shed. And thousands last night in Nashville, over 4,000 showed up. Uh, thousands and thousands of people are coming from everywhere to worship God. I love the fact that you came from missions. You have a mission background and particularly the persecuted church. I know with the news this week that we're all grieving uh, the, the 13 amazing soldiers that gave their life uh, in a horrible, disastrous attack on our soldiers. Thank God that even uh, in between services, another suicide bomber attempt was made but a sniper took the man out that was going to blow up the marines in our camp again and we thank god for that um but you you you've been, you've been on the ground in afghanistan and you have many connections in that nation have you been talking with pastors since all that's been going on, the chaos in the last yeah, few weeks? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to give some good news to you guys this morning. How many need some good news? You know, I, I don't think things needed to, to happen like this. I'm very frustrated, like probably so many of you, but in the midst of this, God's working. And we've found out this week... Um, you know, there's an underground church in, our, in Afghanistan. It's thriving. It's probably the second or third fastest growing church in the world. And it's true. And 
And every time the enemy comes in, and we saw it in the late 80s in Iran with the Ayatollah, we saw it in Iraq with ISIS. I was there before ISIS, during ISIS, now after ISIS, we have a presence on the ground. Every time that strict, intense Islamic Sharia law, crazy demonic stuff gets unleashed, people run and turn to Jesus. And it happens everywhere. And I have a praise report from Afghanistan that there's one church on the outskirts of Kabul that has, uh, I think it's 200, they had 250 people in their underground network. And over the last two weeks, they've grown to over 3,000 people. The gates of hell will not prevail. You, you know what blesses me and challenges me about you and your ministry and what you'll be doing tonight? I mean, to go into those areas and even the areas that you've been going into, you've had, you you guys have been attacked. You've been, you've had Antifa and different ones just try to beat you and hurt you and blood by witches thrown on you. I'm not making this up. Satanists showing up, surrounding them, and they just sing and praise right through it. And God moves. But you're a father of four children. You have a beautiful wife. Why would you go to places like Afghanistan? Why would you go to dangerous places where you can see ISIS from a distance and know that, that you can't blend in? Your blue eyes and your long blonde hair cannot blend in in the Middle East. You know, I just remember reading stories as a kid and in and, and Sunday school and all the Sunday school teachers out there, y'all are heroes. So, you know, you guys are heroes. I remember reading stories about, you know, Jehoshaphat and worshiping and, and, and ambushes were sent against the camp of the enemy and Gideon worshiping and, and, and Jericho, the walls coming down. And I remember just thinking as a kid, man, I wanna see that in my life. Like, I don't care about labels and gold records and dev awards or whatever. Like, I wanna see the power of God yes, manifest sir. in my generation. I wanna see the things we sing about. I wanna see them become reality in my generation. And that's what drove me, you know, that's what still drives me because we can't let these cities like Portland and Seattle and Chicago, we can't just throw them out. Washington DC, we're gonna be there in two weeks. God orchestrated us to have a permit on September 11th for such a time as this. We have a permit on the National Mall and we get to host a worship, prayer and revival service on the National Mall. We get to do this in our day, and I just feel like we got to, for the sake of our children, for the future of America, the worshipers gotta rise up. Yeah. And I know this because we, we talked some. He sent a check this week for $250,000 to secure that site and all that it would take. The first deposit. Um, deposit, just the deposit. deposit, yeah. just the deposit. $250,000. The, 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 the dance floor, the, the turf coverage was $94,000. Because the they're too afraid. They're afraid the we dance too much. <laughs> you called it the dance floor. I love that. I love that. And before he leaves here, this ministry is going to bless his ministry and help him. How many of you believe if ever on 9-11 we needed a praise party in Washington? D.C. It's in this hour. That is prophetic. We love you. We can't wait till six o'clock tonight. He's going to slip out. He was in the first service. I want you to go. You don't have to. You, I want to listen take to you up. preach. No, he, this man can Whatever. preach. Whatever. I'm going to sit right here and okay. listen to him preach. Okay. Well, I tried to get you out, but somebody said, do me that way. No, you sit down and be still. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to open them with me. Isn't that a joy to have Sean and let us worship? We are privileged. We are honored. And I believe God's up to something powerful. I really believe that it's not just a one-day uh, event or night concert. Something's going to break through in this region and in this state. Can we believe for the state of Georgia to be hit with revival? Why not? Why not? Somebody say today. today. I, don't even, I don't even want to wait till six. What about right now? <laughs> oh. I'm reading from Matthew, the seventh chapter. 
And a certain centurion servant, verse 2, who was dear to him, some translations say whom he loved, was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, he begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this, they said, was deserving or he's worthy. Listen to the reason, verse 5. For he loves our nation, and he has built us a synagogue. These are the elders of Israel saying this is why he's worthy. Is he loves the nation, and he's built us churches, we would say. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself. I am not worthy that you should enter into my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. But speak the word, say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, come, and he comes, and one, go, and he goes, and one, do this and do that, and they do it. Listen to verse 9. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. It's the only place in all the Bible that's found. He marveled at him. It didn't happen for any of the disciples. It didn't happen for any of the miracles. It didn't happen for any other occasion in all the Holy Bible where God marveled at him, who was him? A centurion, a Roman soldier. He marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent returned to the house and the servant was well who had been sick. This amazing story happened as Jesus walked off of preaching perhaps the most famous sermon he would ever preach, the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon of Beatitudes. He had just taught one of the great things of that message, to love your enemies, to do good to those who oppress you. And now he walks off of that sermon platform in the mountains of the northern part of Jerusalem. And he walks into his hometown of Capernaum and the elders of Israel come and they say, go to this Roman soldier's house and pray for his servant. Pray for him because he loves this country. Pray for him because he's given enormous resources and built us a synagogue and he's not even one of us. He's a Gentile. He's a Roman soldier, a part of the people who are oppressing and who are, are absolutely overstepping over and on us, and we are under their dominion and control. And Jesus had just taught, love your enemies. Jesus had just taught, pray for those who do wrong. And now it's kind of like, I guess he might have thought, well, I just preached that. I might as well go. But it's interesting that the thing that they came and said he's worthy of a miracle because he loves our nation. Number one, we ought to love Israel. Number two, and he's built our church. He, he's given of his enormous resources and we wouldn't have our synagogue without this man using the resources that that, that he has. And a church is, our synagogue was just where the law was taught. It's just where the morality and the morals of the Old Testament were taught. The Ten Commandments were taught. The five books of the Old Testament were taught. And he liked that. He liked that better than the religion of the Romans. And what I want you to understand is I, there's, there's three quick things that caused this man to stand out. 
This is what great faith can do. That's what I'm preaching on. This is what great faith can do. This man had three things that caught the attention of Jesus and, called him to, and caused him to marvel. The word marvel means to be astonished. The word marvel means to be amazed and to stand in awe. One translation said to take the breath away. Can you imagine God in the skin of human man veiled in flesh was so moved, not by a preacher, not by a disciple, not by a rabbi, not by a scholar of the Torah, not by someone who, who, who performed great miracles, but a man who was not even, I want to call him a non-religious man, exercised so much faith in what Jesus, who he was and what he was able to do. That Jesus said, I'm not impressed with titles and I'm not impressed with religion and I'm not impressed with how many scriptures you can quote and how many praise songs you sing that you really don't mean because you really don't believe that God will do anything that he hasn't, that was beyond normal. But when he saw a non-religious guy look at him and say, don't come to my house, they said he's worthy, but he said, I'm not worthy. And the closer I get to you, because as Jesus started getting close to his house, the closer you get to Jesus, anything in you that's proud and anything in you that's arrogant and anything inside of you that says, I'm worthy, I look at me, I'm wonderful, God ought to bless me. I don't understand why you haven't answered my prayer. I did this, I gave my time, I did that, I did that, I did that. And the closer you get to Jesus, the more you see your own sinfulness and the more you see his holiness and the more you understand... I'm not worthy. You're the worthy lamb that was slain. And everything I get, I deserve only because of your blood and the cross and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I don't deserve anything. Well, we've been going to church all these years and God ought to do something for you. don't deserve anything. All of your righteousness is his filthy rags. But when you look at him and you say, his blood deserves a miracle. His blood deserves my family being saved. His, on, his suffering on the cross absolutely is worthy of a healing in my life. Worthy is the lamb. And when this man, a non-religious man said, when Jesus was getting close to his house, notice what he loved. He loved his country. He loved the country that he was in. And I just want to pause and I want to say I still love America. I still love the red, white, and blue. I still get tears in my eyes when I see a mother get a flag and know that her son died for the, our nation. I still love the national anthem and I stand for it and put my hand on my heart. I'm not ashamed to say I love. This is the greatest nation in the world. There's none like it. He loved the nation he was in. Notice what else he loved. He loved the church and he gave to build it of himself. Boy, when you love the church and you love your nation, and I know in that text it was talking about the nation of Israel, but I don't think there's anything wrong, especially when you've had a week like we've had, that we remind ourselves with all of our bad history and flaws and mess ups and injustices, this is still, all you gotta do is go to Afghanistan. All you gotta do is go to Haiti. All you gotta do is go somewhere in the world where there's no freedom like Russia and you will appreciate the fact that we can raise our hands and we can speak the name of Jesus and not worry about our families being imprisoned or worse. Take a praise break and thank God for our nation. I love our nation and I love my church. Come on, do you love your church? I'm just gonna preach a minute. We better get up and get back in church. We better get up and announce with our physical presence, I love my church. And 
He loved his servant. What kind of person marvels Jesus, astonishes Jesus? Number one, a person who has great love for his country, for Israel, for not only that, but he loved, he, he, he loved the synagogue. He loved the church. He loved it. It was the center. We ought, to, we ought to make church. It still ought to be something we cherish. And then he loved his servant. I read something interesting this week when I was looking into this. A centurion was someone who was over at least 100 soldiers that were under him. A centurion in the Roman army was someone who was not allowed to be married. When he was elevated to that position, it meant that he would give up the right to be married and have a family because he knew eventually he would be sent to foreign soul because the Roman Empire was ever expanding and he would be required to stay and be stationed at that place for up to 20 years, never to come back home from that place that he had been assigned to. And so servants and people that he took with him became like family to them often one commentary said they were their family and so when one of his servants whom he loved got sick he loved him and Jesus was astonished and marveled at this man because of his great love but secondly his great humility because the elder said he's worthy for you to go in his house and do a miracle. But the man said in the text, I didn't even feel worthy to come to you. And now that you're coming to me, I don't feel worthy that you would come under my roof. I got a sneaky suspicion. He probably was thinking to himself, I've got, I've got altars and images and statues to gods that I burn incense and make blood sacrifices to, just like all the Romans did. They're all in my home. They're all out in my yard and in my garden. I, I, I worship all kinds of gods. And he's a holy, he is God in the flesh. He is, I, I sense this is, this is the God of all gods, the king of all kings, and I'm not worthy that he would come in. That's humility. Humility says, Lord, I'm not worthy, but you're worthy. And then lastly, he had great faith. And when Jesus approached his house and they told him what the man said, he said, just tell him to speak the word only. And my servant will be healed. What he was saying was, I know who you are. And Jesus, the Bible said, did something that the angels couldn't make him do. The sun, the moon, the stars could not make him do. Nobody in the scriptures made him do. Nothing that happened in all of creation made him marvel. It never says after he created something or he did something or he performed some miracle and God marveled on his throne. The only time that God Almighty marveled is when he saw a non-religious man who recognized who he was behind that veil of flesh. Listen, and the power of his spoken word to do what he said it would do. And the Bible said that it took the breath away of Jesus for a moment. It stunned him. It astounded him. And God or Jesus marveled. He stepped back and said, wow. Not in all of Israel with all these religious people have I ever seen faith like this. The only thing that can make God be astonished and, and stun God and marvel God is a mere man who recognizes who he is 
and that the power of what he says, he can make it happen. And he said, go because your servant is healed. And they went back and the servant was healed. A non-religious man believed and it marveled Jesus. A mere man could make God almighty marvel. And when Jesus marvels, it ought to make us meditate on why. Anybody that can marvel God, blow God's mind, I want to know why. I want to know how can a, I I mean, I I fast 21 days, God doesn't marvel. I, I pray and read my Bible and bring my tithe, God doesn't marvel. And here's a guy who's not even half nothing. He's a non religious guy, but he just believes. I love that God says, You don't have to impress me with your religious stuff. That's all good. It's disciplines. It's all, but it's all about believing in who I am and what I have promised you. Even when you're suffering, I can make it happen. Even when it doesn't look good, I can turn it around. Even when you have no answers and you have no no hope almost, you still believe that makes God marvel. When Joshua fought five different armies and the sun started going down, That same spirit came on him. And this brash captain looked up at the sun setting and he knew that I've got the enemy on the run and when the sun goes down, they're gonna get away and they're gonna keep coming back and attacking me and my family and my nation and my people. And so he prays a bold prayer in Joshua chapter 10. He said in the sight of all of Israel, he prayed, son, stand thou still. And moon stand still. And the sun stood still about a whole day until the people had avenged themselves of their enemy. And there was no day like that before and after that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. The sun didn't make God marvel. A mere man who, who made the big ask, who had the boldness and the courage to look up at the sun and say to the sun that God created, I'm a man set under authority and I've got a name that I can call on. The God who hung that sun, I want you to make it stand still. And God stopped the universal orbit for one man I don't know what's in orbit. I don't know what's moving and you think it's unstoppable. But when you stand up and you say, but Lord, I don't have to have you come into my house and see a vision of you glowy at night. You just send the word. You give me a promise and I'll take that promise and I'll go against all the orbit of everything coming around and I'll stand and say, stand still. Let the word come and bring to pass what God has promised. Somebody praise God that only you and I can make God marvel. I want you right now just to look over at somebody and pat your chest and say, I can make God be astonished. I can astonish Jesus. I can marvel God. I can this morning when I believe his word above what I see and what I feel. Glory. Listen to what the Bible said in Hebrews 11. By faith, we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. So we understand that the things that are made are made of things which do not appear. Everything that is here is original. (laughs) And they appeared by things that we can't see. That's God. All things were created in heaven and in earth. All things were created for him and by him, visible and invisible. Whether there be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, he is before all things and he is, and he, and by him all things consist. How in the world can you marvel and astonish and stun and take away the breath of a God who just created it all? He just, he just opened his mouth and said, let there 
thee and the spittle from his mouth created galaxies and this planet and he hung this earth on nothing, Job said. He hung the world on nothing. You can't hang your hat on nothing, but God took nothing, made it into something and then hung it on nothing. And then he spit turns around and spins his finger and all of a sudden everything's moving. It's just really amazing when you think about it. This 8,000 mile wide ball that we call earth rotating at 1,000 miles per hour while soaring around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. And when you're standing or sitting still, even if you don't move for 24 hours and you just sit your blessed assurance in that seat, the whole time you have moved every 24 hours one and a half million miles a day. And the one who controls all things and spoke it and when he created it and he put it all out there, he never marveled about that. The magnificent earth full of mystery and beauty, sea life, plant life, uh, animal life, human life, the physical body, the earth is just his footstool. The star Teres is able to swallow up 64 million suns greater than the one sun that we have over Earth. The star Epsilon is 3,000 times the size of our sun. Our closest star to planet Earth is 26 trillion miles away. The furthest star is 59 sec trillion miles away. We are just a speck, planet Earth, in the big picture of all of God's creation. But none of that stuff marvels God. None of that stuff astonishes God. God is not impressed. As a matter of fact, this blows my mind. When God got ready to take credit for all creation, he, and, and, he, and he wanted to mention I made the stars too. This is what he said, he used five words. He made the stars also. No big deal. I created all living thing. And by the way, just as a footnote, I made the stars also. That's how big and bad I am. So nothing, nothing in this universe made God marvel. But when a man, when a woman, when a mother, when a dad, when a teenager, when a young person stands up and says, I believe what God has spoken to me, he's going to bring to pass. God says, oh, oh my goodness, I'm astonished. They believe it. They don't just say it. They believe it. They don't just sing it, they believe it. Does anybody want to astonish Jesus by believing his word? Woo. Hallelujah. When you stand and you say, Lord, I'm still confident. I don't see it, I don't feel it, I don't understand it, I don't have answers, but I'm still confident, I still trust you, I still praise you, I still honor you. You make Jesus Christ be astonished and stunned. Seas parting, the, the Red Sea becoming like jello. I'm sure there was a little snotty-nosed kid in the, in the children of Israel when they were walking through on dry ground that had to poke it one time. And it, was, it, was just, it would just tremble and shake like jello, standing up on both sides, and they're walking across. But God did not marvel. A donkey opened its mouth and, and preached to the prophet Balaam, and God did not marvel. A whale swallowed a man for three days and spit him up afterwards and he came out like a, like a raisin with no hair and all, all shriveled up and, and came out preaching. No eyebrows. You know, all those acids had eaten everything away and he's just, a, he looked like some kind of weirdo, but he repented. I would have repented if I saw that, but God did not marvel. 
an ax head doing the backstroke across the Jordan River and God did not marvel. A bush burning and lighting up in the wilderness and saying, take off your shoes, 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 shoes. You're standing on holy ground, ground, ground. I would marvel, but burning bushes didn't marvel God. 26,000 tons of manna every morning at the tent door of the Israelites for 40 years didn't marvel God. Water coming out of rocks didn't marvel God. Dead men being raised like Lazarus didn't marvel God. But when someone says, Lord, speak the word only, and I don't know how you're going to provide. I don't know how you're going to deliver. I don't know how you're going to work a miracle, but I believe in you and your ability to get it done. Come on, somebody with a shout of praise. The devil didn't think you'd come to church and praise God like you're praising him. That makes heaven marvel. Old Jehoshaphat got a bad, bad letter from Sennacherib. Evil king. He said, I've got 600 chariots of iron and I'm going to run all over you. And he sent it in a letter. He took the letter to the temple, put it on the altar, looked up to heaven and said, God, we, we got mail. Because <laughs> you put me here and I know you're good and I know you're faithful and I know you love me and I don't understand this attack. And I don't understand this letter. I don't understand this x-ray. I don't understand this news. I don't understand these dark days. But I know you're working all things together for the good. And so God said, well, I'll tell you what to do, Jehoshaphat. Take the praise singers and tell them to get out on the front line. Don't send any weapons with them. Just give them a tambourine and give them a harp and give them a violin, give them a guitar and a saxophone and, 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 and tell them to get out there and do nothing but talk about how good I am and how merciful I am and how I'm a generational God and my mercy endures from one generation to another. Don't care what the times bring. Don't care what the culture brings. Don't care what, time, what evil brings. Don't care what Antichrist wants to bring. Bring it on. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And the Bible said when they got out there and they started praising God, that's why what we're going to do tonight, that's why what we're doing in here, it's more than the loud, annoying person behind you while you're trying to soak it all in. No, sometimes you don't understand. That's a former alcoholic. That's a former jailbird. That's a, that one on your right over there. Look at him. He's a former alcoholic. That one was a manic depressive. That one was lost. That one was sick and dying of COVID. But here they are in church this morning. You don't know why people are so noisy. You need to leave them alone. Maybe the Bible said rejoice with them that rejoice. Uh-oh. That means if anybody on your row starts rejoicing, you have a biblical mandate to jump in and say, I don't even know what we're shouting about, but let's go. Let's go. Let's go. That includes the balcony. Let's go. That includes coming and Spartanburg and Midtown. Let's go. Orange County. Gwinnett. Somewhere else. Stand to your feet. One of the most touching stories in the Bible to me, especially with all that's going on in Afghanistan. Do you understand what that man just said? Do you understand what he just said? Do you understand how the persecuted church, this is not a game to them. That if they are caught worshiping in Kabul today, they will be reported. Somebody will tell and their daughters could be kidnapped and given to some man to be raped and used the rest of her life never to hear the name of Jesus again. The 
One of the most moving verses in the Bible to me is when the first martyr was being stoned named Stephen. As they were hitting him with stones, the same demon, demons never die, the same demon that hates Christianity, that is manifest with soldiers and with swords in their hands making Christians on the beach get down and either deny Jesus Christ or be beheaded. Well, there's a church in Afghanistan right now somewhere in a basement and they're calling on Jesus and they're worshiping Jesus. And when Stephen was being stoned, the Bible said every other place in the New Testament, you check me out, where Jesus is found after the crucifixion, he's sitting at the right, he's in heaven and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Only one time does it say different. And it's when Stephen's being stoned and he looked up and the heavens open and he saw Jesus, watch this, standing. You don't understand what I'm saying. When you stand up for Jesus, you need to hear this. When you stand up for Jesus, he'll stand up for you. I can't imagine the flag. I, I've taken a lot of flag, but I can't imagine the flag you're taking. But oh, man of God, when you stand up for Jesus, look out. God stands up for you. We have the ability to marvel and astonish and stun God and make heaven stand up. I heard a powerful story this week from a, from a great, great preacher friend of mine that texts and calls me every once in a while. And he said, he said that there was a missionary in his, in his ministerial group who went to Sri Lanka, which I believe is a part of India. I, I, don't, I didn't even have time to check this, but it, it's near, near India. And is it part of India? I don't know. Does anybody know? No. So it's near, it's borders with India. That's the way he told it. And he said this pastor went there. They had never had a Christian church in this community. Never. Worshiping multiple gods, statues. If you've ever been there, you know, you know the culture. And this guy goes in and he's preaching Jesus' name and he's baptizing the believers in the holy river that's dedicated to all those gods. And they're getting saved and getting baptized and getting saved and getting baptized. And this is what he said happened. He said the priest in that area got so upset that they took poison and they snuck in in the cover of night and poured poison in his well the water that they only water they have to drink, to clean, to cook, to wash with. He po they poisoned the well, and someone, a sympathizer from 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 the community, heard about it and came at four in the morning and slid a note up under the door and said, "Don't drink the water; it's poison." And so that man called his bishop and he said, "What am I going to do?" And the bishop said, "Let me pray about it." And he prayed about it and called him a few hours later. And he said, I found in 2 Kings chapter 3 a story of poison water in the Bible and God told the prophet to pour salt in the water and then to drink it. And he said, that's what I want you to do. <laughs> True story. I believe this man. I know this man. He, don't, he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't make this up. He said his friend went home, got the phone call and told his wife and his children, they got on their knees, they prayed, they heard from heaven. Listen to this. He said they went outside and they pulled the bucket up and said that there were people that were watching and the priest had basically set up a, a little camp across the street having a celebration. And he pulls the water out and he says, in the name of Jesus, if I drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt me. And he drinks the water and his family drinks the water and nothing happened to him. The people were astonished, but wait a minute. 
A few months later, a massive drought hits that place and every whale in the city, including all those priest whales, they all dried up. There was only one whale that preacher called his bishop. He said, the whole city is lined up at my church every morning wanting water. What happened? One man heard a word from God and he stood on it and he astonished and marveled heaven and God said, I'll stand by that man. I'll stand by that woman. I'll stand by that grandmother. I'll stand by that mother, that son that takes a stand on what God has promised. Throw your hands up all over this room and with a mighty praise begin to cry out for your family. Cry out for our city. Cry out for our nation. Uh, do I have any veterans? Do I have any soldiers who would dare love your country? <laughs> oh, God, send revival among our Marines. Send revival among our soldiers. Oh, God, send revival to our cities. Send it to whole County. Send it Send it to this church. Send it to every church in this community, oh God. Every denomination, every move, oh God. We ask for your power to be poured out. We believe. We believe in the last days sons and daughters will prophesy. We believe a household shall be saved. right now every backslider every person addicted every person bound every person suicidal every person depressed every person hating themselves every person cutting themselves every person torturing themselves every person feeling like you just wish you could die you almost hope you would get killed you can't stand your life i feel like if you'll get out of your seat if your heart is broken if your life is empty if you will get out of your seat and run to this altar there's a miracle you will astonish jesus you will get the attention of god your faith will cause heaven to stand up. Don't sit there. Don't stand there. Move out by faith. Move. Why sit there until you die? Move. Move. Come home. Come home. Come home. Come up. Come out of that. Come out of that in Jesus' name. Come on. Come on. Oh, I feel it at every campus. At every campus. Come home.
every person in this room who needs a miracle in your home, in your family, in your physical body, or someone that you love. Maybe you love somebody and they're sick and they're not able to be here. Get out of your seat and come on their behalf. Just like that man did. You're sending for help. You're sending for a word. Maybe you've got a drug addict. Maybe you've got an alcoholic in your family. Maybe somebody's so depressed that you've got them on a suicidal watch. Get out of your seat and come on their behalf. Come believing. Come with hands raised. Come saying, God, pat your chest and say, Lord, let my faith in your word, not in myself, but in your word. I don't have faith in my faith. I have faith in the worthy lamb of God. Let it marvel you. Let it stun you. Let it cause you to stagger. Oh, God, do it. Do it today. Now lift those hands. We decree miracles. We decree signs and wonders. We decree angelic visitations. We decree prophetic words. We decree direction. We decree ordered steps. We decree open prison doors. We decree chains dropping, chains breaking, lies of deception being peeled off.
something and I'm careful and I know I try the spirit and I've really been trying it Sean let Free Chapel pay that two hundred and fifty thousand dollars because we're going to pay it when you stood up Jesus stood up and he knows how to get a word to a preacher to write the check. It's done in Jesus' name. And he's already speaking to others to write the rest of the check to fill the national mall with praise and glory for the honor of our king. Let the church say amen. Come on and shout.
clap your hands and give the Lord a mighty praise. You believe it? Everybody in this room say, Jesus, I confess you as my Lord. You are the Word. You are the Word clothed in flesh. In the beginning was the Word. So you are God. And today, I receive you as my Savior, as my Deliverer, as my Healer, as my Provider. I cast it all at your feet. And I just worship you. Give me a new spirit of adoration. Give me a new joy in praise. Let something, let us, let us, I, I, I just see a, a light switch, an old school light switch. Flip the switch and turn the praise back on, the gratitude back on, the worship back on in my walk with you. Tonight when we assemble at six o'clock, let the power of the Lord be present to heal. Settle down over this 150 acres. It used to be a bee hive, bee farm, and milk dairy farm. Make it tonight the land where milk and honey flows. <laughs> Glory. And we give you all the praise. Everybody raise your hand and receive the blessing. If you prayed that prayer, you're born again. You're part of the family. You're saved. Go by the next steps booth back there and say, I want to get baptized. I want to get in the river. And, and we've got a baptism in here and we've got it outside too. And you can be baptized. The next baptism service is coming up real soon. And let the miracle flow begin in your life. Don't turn back. Go all the way. You, you didn't play around with sin when you were in sin. Go all the way with God. Give him equal time and effort. How many of you believe as we sow a $250,000 seed into this ministry that's touching major cities in America, including our own, that God will bring a harvest back on our sons and our daughters and our families and our community? How many of you want the favor and blessing of God on this region and on our, I just hear it, statewide revival in Georgia. Let it start with the preachers like me. You ready? You ready for the blessing? All of you give. I need you to give 250000 this morning. You don't see me laughing, do you? I believe in you that much. You'll do it. Somebody write the whole thing right now. Obey God. Obey God. When God asks you for a seed, He has a harvest on His mind. And the harvest is always greater than the seed. So just believe it. Now here's the blessing. Are you ready? And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make His face shine on you. Be gracious unto you. Lift up His countenance upon you. And give you peace in Jesus' mighty name. We love you all so much. You need to get on the phone. You need to call at least three people and invite them to come to church with you tonight outside. It's going to be a beautiful weather. Everything's perfect. And we'll begin promptly at 6 o'clock. And we don't know where it's going. It's totally wherever God leads them to take it. We're just going to be in the middle of it, praising and exalting our Savior. It's going to be a power. Something's going to begin tonight. I sense it. You don't want to miss it. Call some people. Invite them to come. We love you so much. God bless you. An amazing week this week while you're leaving. You know, we were able, because of your generosity, to write a check for $50,000 to a little ministry right down the road, right here on McEverest. It's not our building. It's not our ministry. 
But there it is, the family promise of Hall County. They take in homeless women and children. They re converted that church that was up on the hill down there. And we just decided to sow a $50,000 seed this week and say, Lord, bless them and help them and keep them. We were also able to close on our brand new property and pay cash for it in downtown Atlanta. And that's a done deal. That's a free chapel, Jesus kingdom building that is, is ours for the glory of God right in the heart of Midtown Atlanta. For God be the glory. We've had a church down there for two weeks and they're going to go in full. Hallelujah. And it's going to be exciting. We're going to see what God's going to do down there. So many other things because of your generosity, we are going to be able to write a hundred thousand dollar check to Haiti and help those precious people who are in dire need after the hurricane. And Lord, we pray for New Orleans and we pray for the Gulf Coast and we pray oh God that you would help us be a blessing where we need to be a blessing we give you all the glory we give you all the praise in Jesus mighty name thank you for your generosity we'll, if God can get it to us he'll get it through us if he can get it through us he'll get it to us so be a vessel get in and all this good sowing if you're a tither and a giver you're the miracle that's making that happen and may God bless you richly, we pray. Be blessed, everybody. Divine, divine conference is coming. Cece Winans, woo, the best. Lisa Brevere and, and Pastor Jensen Franklin. He's going to be preaching. All of these, this is our team. It's coming up September. Women, 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 you must get registered today, September the 17th and 18th. Go get signed up, get registered. You say, I can't afford it. Just get signed up and if you can't afford it, we'll take care of that too. I just believe God will take care of all of it. And if you'll get signed up, he'll supply the money. Watch him. Use your faith. Write, this, write the script. God bless you. We love you. Be blessed. Welcome back, Free Chapel Online. What a powerful service that was. Pastor Jensen just preached an incredible message, and the presence of God is just so powerful in this room, and I pray that it, that same presence touched you wherever you are at home, wherever you're watching. And if you made the decision today to accept Jesus, we are celebrating with you. Welcome to the family. You have just made the greatest decision of your life. We are so excited um, to have you a part of this family. If you accepted Jesus, we want you to text the word yes to 510510. And we have a team of people ready to pray for you, ready to welcome you, and ready um, just to give you some resources. Also, if if you need prayer today, if if you want someone from our team to pray with you, text the word pray to 510-510. We have a team of people ready to be there for you, lift you up and pray with you. We want to thank you for your continued generosity. Um, your giving is making a greater impact than you ever could know. We're able to reach those in Haiti and all around the world in our local community because of your generosity and your giving. Um, and we just, we thank you for that. And today we have a super special guest. We have Dr. Rich, uh, who's one of our pastors on staff, and he's going to talk to us about next steps today. Welcome, Dr. Rich. Thank you so much. Uh, online campus, I am so excited to, to formally meet you. I've talked to many of you in the chat, and uh, we are just excited that you joined us today. Not only are you, not only are you one of our eight campuses, you are the fastest growing campus that we have. Yes. And Morgan's right. We are developing a passionate group of leaders yes. and team members that are devoted just to making your church experience just as authentic as the face-to-face -face campus. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Rich, uh, we had some of our online campus members send in some questions this week about next steps. So our first question we have uh, from Crystal, uh, what is next steps? Next Steps is your opportunity to go from watching and observing to connecting and belonging. It's a four-step process that takes you through what we believe, uh, what makes us distinct. It talks about ways that you can grow, that you can serve, and you can connect and give in the online campus. It's a four-session uh, online experience to help you connect with the church in a real way. 
Wow, that's so good. Um, someone asked, if I complete next steps, does that mean I'm a member? It means that you understand everything that we are and you understand what you believe and how that connects with what we believe. If you want to become a member, there's an opportunity in Next Steps to actually take that step and become a member. We are even work, even working on baptism experiences yes. all over the world to help you connect in that way as well. Yes. Okay. Uh, Kara asks, how long does it take to complete Next Steps online? It's an online uh, four-phase process, and you work at it at your own pace. You can finish it in one hour in one sitting, or you can take your time and go through each of the four phases. Yes. Um, someone asks, can I take Next Steps if I live outside of the U.S.? One of the amazing things about the online campus is it has no borders. It is worldwide. When I've been in the, the online chat, Morgan, I have literally spoken to people from all over the yes. world every single Sunday. We are excited about the, that it's an international church as well as here in America. Yes, absolutely. And the last question we have, what are ways I can get involved after I've completed Next Steps? That's what we're working hard to make happen right now. Not only can you observe and watch the services every week, which are amazing services, you're going to be able to connect in small groups, in discipleship, in uh, serving opportunities, in outreach. There's a way for every person to connect the same way our folks connect right here at our, at our eight campuses. Incredible. Well, we hope that gave you some information about Next Steps, and we encourage you to sign up for Next Steps. You will not regret it. It is one of the best decisions you can make and just a wonderful way to get involved in the life of our church. Well, thank you, Dr. Rich, for joining us today. Uh, would you mind praying us out uh, for the online campus? Absolutely. Lord Jesus, we just lift up the online campus. Lord, Lord especially those affected by all that's going on in Afghanistan, Lord Jesus, whether it be people on the ground there, whether it be the online church, some of whom may be watching right now, or maybe it's a family, Lord, that's lost a service member this week that was there, Lord Jesus. We just lift them up. We lift up every single situation in the online campus right now, Lord. We pray for families. We pray for children. We pray for families that have a lost member in their family that they want to come to know you. We lift them up, Lord. May they know that you are as real in this online service as any place else, Lord Jesus. And we just give them to you. Lord, you've entrusted us with much, Lord. And may, may they feel our love and our passion towards their church experience. I pray in your precious name. Amen. Amen. We'll see you guys next week. I am